A school is not bricks and mortar. It is humanity and microcosm. It is a dream, a wish, a hope for the future. It is a message from the past to tomorrow. It is founded on knowledge and fueled by idealism. It functions on the efforts and dedication of its staff and is inspired by the example of their predecessors. Some of these have loaned their names to these collections of bricks and people and aspirations. They are the faces behind the schools. We salute those educators for whom schools in our parish are named. T.H. Harris was State Superintendent of Public Education in Louisiana from 1908 until 1940. During his long tenure, a state system of public education became a reality. He changed Louisiana schools from a system of two to three month tuition academies to the system of free public education for all that we know today. He was not born with the name T.H. Harris, but Lee Marcus Harris. Through a series of events in his youth, he was moved to change his name. He was to change much more. The son of a Methodist minister, he was born March 26, 1869 in Claiborne Parish, where he spent the first 21 years of his life amid the cotton farms of the area. His life was one of farm chores. There was no place in it for school. There were, in fact, no schools, except for a few centers scattered around the parish which met for a month or two. His father and a Civil War veteran operated an excellent private school which taught English, math, Latin, and Greek, in which his older brothers received a solid grounding. But by the time he was old enough to attend, hardships brought about by his father's death and the scattering of the elder brothers about the South left him head of the family. He was 16. For five years, he ran the family farm and helped raise his younger brothers and sister. At the age of 21, he decided it was time to see to his own education. An older brother had started a school which was the image of the one his father had headed. The tuition would be free. Tom Harris started school in a two-room schoolhouse in which the older students who chewed tobacco had cuspidors by their desks. After one session at the school, Tom Harris entered the public school system of Louisiana. His brother Dayton was the parish superintendent for Claiborne Parish, as well as head of the private academy. He appointed Tom to teach at a one-room school for a two-month session at a salary of $25 per month. With typical honesty, he rated his teaching skills as crude, but he was only following the practice of the day, teach what you know by repetition. The combination of teaching and study continued until the 1890s, at which time he entered college with the goal of becoming a qualified teacher. There he learned methods other than repetition and discovered textbooks that were accessible and appealing to students. There he learned the value of universal education in the hands of trained teachers. As a trained teacher, he worked in Lake Charles and Winsboro. He became principal of a school in Opelousas. He later went to LSU as a teacher student, resigning that post to become head of the schools in Baton Rouge. In 1904, James B. Aswell of Jackson Parish, who had been trained at Peabody College in Tennessee, was elected state superintendent of education on a platform of bringing public education in Louisiana into the 20th century. Tom Harris served on the State Board of Education at this time. He joined with Aswell in plans to remove political influence from the running of the school system and place education in the hands of the teachers. They also set standards for certifying superintendents and school board members. Finally, they set out to establish a system of high schools which would prepare students for entry into college. In 1908, he himself became state superintendent of education. One of his first acts was to put the funding of public education in Louisiana on a sound basis. This was a struggle of many years, which he managed to win with the help of Huey P. Long. He also moved to set standards for teacher certification, establish the system of high schools, build adequate physical plants, set up consolidated high schools in non-urban areas, upgrade the black schools of the state, establish trade schools, and provide free textbooks for students. 
These things in place, he sought to make education a profession by instituting the tenure law, a retirement system, and instituting clear lines of authority from the state boards of education through the state superintendent, the parish superintendents, the principals, and the teachers to the students who are the recipients and the prime reasons for the existence of the system. He chose to leave office in 1940 so as to enjoy his remaining years in travel and fishing. He left content. He had found education a collection of fiefdoms. He left an organized system of educating the youth of Louisiana. We are his heirs. We salute those educators for whom schools in our parish are named. In his early youth, Alfred Bonneville settled in the Metairie section of Jefferson Parish, where his father had extensive land holdings. He engaged in planting, stock raising, and real estate development. A man of considerable wealth, he devoted much of his time to community enterprises and works of charity. Immediately following the war between the states, he appreciated the importance and the necessity of formally educating the youth of the South so that his beloved section of the country could throw off the shackles of carpetbag rule and regain its rightful place in the nation's development of its commerce and industry. With this in mind, he directed his attention to the political affairs of Jefferson Parish. He served 27 years as a member of the police jury and 46 years as a member of the board of school directors of Jefferson Parish, the predecessor of our present Jefferson Parish School Board. He was responsible for the construction of the first public school in Jefferson to be placed on the east bank of the Mississippi. His later daughter-in-law, Luella Van Rankin Bonneville, was the first principal of the school, which was located on the present site of Haynes Middle School on Metairie Road between Magnolia and Hollywood Drives. He was a man with a keen sense of business acumen and fully appreciated the great economic potential of his parish, which would surely grow and bear fruit for the benefit of all its residents if they would but invest in a strong school system where both the advantaged and the disadvantaged children could acquire a well-rounded education. He had seen ignorance exploited by unconscionable men after the war and vowed it should never happen again. It was well he knew that the educated child had a better than even chance of living a life of fulfillment. Upon his death in 1918, the local press referred to Alfred Bonneville as the father of public education in Jefferson Parish. We salute those educators for whom schools in our parish are named. Joshua L. Butler Sr. was the 11th of 17 children. Born in poverty, Mr. Butler's father and older brothers labored in the sugarcane fields of his little farm, cutting cane and doing menial labor that the younger Butlers might be educated. Mr. Butler began his education in a one-room schoolhouse, completing his elementary education at the academy in his native Homa. For his high schooling, he worked as a handyman and lived on the premises of Peck's Memorial Home in New Orleans. Graduation found him entering New Orleans University, later to become Dillard, as a pre-medical student. Though quite successful academically, economics would not permit of such an arduous course of study, so he entered education. Prior to his graduation, he taught for several years at Godet School, but a change of administration forced him to look elsewhere to support his growing family. Through his brother, he learned of an opening in Jefferson Parish. For the princely salary of $320 a year, he started teaching at Rosenwald Elementary in 1930. Though Rosenwald was an accredited school, an accredited high school for black students did not exist at that time in Jefferson Parish. Students who completed the seventh grade either got married or dropped out of school. This greatly disturbed Mr. Butler, who was now principal. He endeavored to change the situation by negotiation with a seemingly less than amenable school board. Diplomacy was also required with members of his own community who were similarly resistant to change. During these times of frustration, Mr. Butler was encouraged by Superintendent Higgins and others to continue. At last, Mr. Butler acquired a high school for Rosenwald, but not an accredited one. 
Students completing the 11th grade were forced to go elsewhere to be accepted into colleges. This was not Mr. Butler's dream. His dream was to have a fully equipped plant to meet the needs of all West Bank students, a plant that would compete favorably with any other high school. Finally, both elementary and high school at Rosenwall were accredited. Colleges began to unquestioningly accept graduates of Rosenwall, whose name was later changed to Marrero Oswego until Lincoln High School came into existence. Before the state or parish established a lunch program, Joshua Butler had one at his school. Maintenance was a problem. Mr. Butler and the larger boys made the repairs. The stoves needed wood. Mr. Butler provided it. In 1952, the pressures of post-war population growth created Lincoln High in elementary in Marrero. Because of Mr. Butler's vision, many cultural activities were organized to improve school community relations. Operettas, dances, PTAs, teas, booster clubs, music concerts, proms, rallies, art displays. Since many students could not succeed academically, Mr. Butler promoted athletic achievement. Without a qualified coach or equipment, Mr. Butler implemented plans for an athletic program which resulted in the eventual hiring of a qualified teacher coach. Above all, it was Mr. Butler's goal to improve instruction and curriculum so that his graduates could face society with enthusiasm, health, and the skills for success. During the years of his separation from Lincoln and his retirement, Mr. Butler suffered from the pain of separation as well as physical ills. He died on June 25, 1965. He had nurtured what was to become a major high school in its intellectual and physical development through the embryonic, infant, adolescent, and adult stages. He suffered as it grew. He rejoiced as its graduates succeeded. This was his dream, to take potential talent from the community, to nurture and mature it in its development, and above all, to return it to the community to serve others. This he did. They are his true monument. Marie Bordes Riviere was born August 15, 1907. She graduated from Mount Carmel in 1928. Mrs. Riviere began her teaching career in 1928 at the old two-room Bonneville School located on Lake Pontchartrain. There were four teachers on the faculty, and each teacher taught several grades. Upon the death of the principal, Mrs. Bailey, Mrs. Riviere became principal teacher of the Bonneville School. In the late 1930s, Mrs. Riviere and her faculty, which now consisted of six members, were moved to a new school, East End Elementary School, which was built on the 17th Street Canal. Mrs. Riviere continued her duties there as a principal teacher. It was during that period of time that the Federal Lunch Program was established, and Mrs. Riviere handled all business connected with this program. In September 1961, Mrs. Riviere and her faculty, which had now grown to 14 members, were again transferred to another new school, the present one now located on Lake Avenue, which bears her name. She continued her duties there as a principal teacher for two years, and then became a full-time principal from that time. Her faculty had increased by this time to 23 members. In the 43 years of service to the community of East End, formerly known as Bucktown, Mrs. Riviere became known not only as an educator, but as a beloved friend to the three generations of children she taught, her faculty, and all other members under her administration. She never hesitated to assist anyone, whether it be to further their education or to help in any physical need. As one mother remarked, Mrs. Riviere was never too busy to listen to any parent's problem concerning his child, and she always gave encouragement and advice. Mrs. Riviere lived to see many of her former students become professional people, lawyers, engineers, judges, teachers, and so on. She lived to see her former two-room wooden school over the lake grow into a spacious brick air-conditioned building situated on two squares of beautifully landscaped grounds. Its frontage is beautified by an oak tree and a plaque that were dedicated in 1968 by the Parent Co-op Club in her honor for the many years of service and love she had given to her school and the community of East End. Harold M. Keller 
was born in Bunky, Louisiana in 1924. He attended the University of Southwestern Louisiana. He served in World War II in the China-Burma-India Theater of Operations and also served his country during the Korean War. He was perhaps an ordinary man, judged by the standards of ordinary parents of school students who may serve as officers of the PTA. But this ordinary man exhibited extraordinary devotion to the educational and developmental processes of the youth of Jefferson Parish which spark of devotion kindled through his years to a flame of dedication that truly set this man apart from the ordinary in the eyes of all those who took the patience to see. At first, his talents and attention were given to the Bissonnet Plaza School attended by his only daughter. With the creation of the then James Madison School, which now bears his name, and in which his only son was to receive his entire elementary education, he served as PTG president for two consecutive terms and gave of himself tirelessly. When a stage was needed for performances and school assemblies, he personally donated the materials and provided for its construction. He arranged for fundraising activities such as the faculty basketball game to raise money for needy families at Christmas. He even had the humility to personally cook and serve a gumbo for the faculty on the occasion of a day of in-service training. More importantly, perhaps, he was instrumental in seeing that the school met the requirements for certification by the Southern Association procuring the necessary teaching materials and library books. When the school was faulted for the size of its library, he again came to its assistance and saw to it that the library size was doubled. Long active in the works of his church and religious fellowship groups, a leader in the Boy Scouts, he expanded his sphere of concern by serving on the Jefferson Parish School Board assuming office in January of 1973 and winning re-election in 1976. While there, he was a member of its executive committee and building committee, where he was considered one of the board's most knowledgeable members in the areas of school construction and land acquisition. Given his concern for his God, his community, and the youth of Jefferson Parish, it is perhaps appropriate that his last moments on earth were spent engaging in sports activity with young people when he died on December 14, 1976. He had a profound love and concern for the school which now bears his name. And in view of the fact that perhaps no solitary individual had given so much publicly and privately to that cause, upon petition, the school was renamed in his memory after his untimely death. Miss Lucille Charbonnier was a lifelong citizen of the West Bank of Jefferson Parish, graduating from McDonough Jefferson High School where she later taught. She earned a BA from Newcomb College and an MA from the University of Wisconsin. She began teaching under her old principal, Miss Helen Cox, at McDonough Jefferson in 1924 and later at Gretna High School. She was assistant principal at West Jefferson High School from its opening in 1955 until her retirement in 1966. She was a stern disciplinarian, but she was respected and loved because she was always fair in her discipline. Her methods were positive, and a misdeed was never held against a student once the price for it was paid. She never talked down to either parents nor students. She respected people as individuals, but held high expectations for all, students, teachers, parents, and administrators. It was a tribute to her judgment and her knowledge of people that they usually lived up to her expectations. Throughout her more than 40 years in education, she was a strong advocate for public education. Her highest tribute was, he or she is a product of the Jefferson Parish school system. After retirement, Ms. Charbonnier continued to help the young people she loved so well by volunteering as a tutor for students from West Jefferson and L.W. Higgins. She walked or rode the bus, as she did not drive, 
to be of service to those who needed her. Service was the cornerstone of her long life. She founded the Newman Club at Gretna High School. She taught CCD classes at St. Joseph Church. She was a charter member of the Jefferson Parish Retired Teachers Association. She served as president of the American Association of University Women. She was on the board of directors of the Jefferson Parish chapter of the Red Cross. During World War II, she organized volunteers at the Port of Embarkation Hospital in Harahan. Her home telephone was the night emergency number for the Red Cross in time of crisis and disaster. She worked to organize volunteers and to provide food, clothing, and shelter to the victims of hurricanes and floods. She was also a pioneer in civil rights. In 1947, she became a charter member of the Commission on Human Rights of the Catholic Committee of the South. In those days, serving on such a committee was an act of utmost courage, but Lucille Charbonnier lacked neither convictions nor courage. To act on one's convictions was a given in the life of this committed, giving, loving human being. When the question rose of naming a school in her honor, one of her former teachers responded, you would not honor Lucille Charbonnier by naming a school for her. You would honor the school. You would honor the teachers. You would honor the students who learn in a school named for this magnificent woman. Another said, Ms. Charbonnier was an excellent educator. Her career represents the best that an educator can give to the youth of a public school system. Her career touched most of the adult population of the West Bank. Her memory shines as an influence toward excellence. Her teaching lives in those of us who were moved toward excellence by her. Lemuel Wallace Higgins was born on December 10, 1907 in Gretna, Louisiana. He died on February 24, 1964 at the age of 56. The educator, whose teaching career began in 1931, started his schooling at the original McDonough No. 26 Elementary School, graduated from the McDonough Jefferson High School, and obtained his B.A. degree from Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge, in 1931. He received a master's degree from Tulane University in 1938. For his thesis, he wrote the authoritative history, The Public Schools of Jefferson Parish Before the Civil War. He taught school at Jefferson High under Joseph Fairchild, then Gretna High under Mrs. Helen Cox, both of whom have schools named in their honor. He served as a teacher and a coach in the parish schools from 1931 to 1936. Then he was chosen assistant superintendent. In 1940, he succeeded the late J.C. Ellis as superintendent. Recognition as an outstanding citizen and educator on local, state, and national levels was attested by the United States Office of Education selecting the Jefferson Parish School System to be toured by Asian and European educators studying the American education system. In 1961, Mr. Higgins was given the Boswell Club of New Orleans annual certificate as the outstanding superintendent in Louisiana. According to the citation accompanying this award, Mr. Higgins was named for his untiring efforts in the interest of public education and his ability to cope with the many problems of a fast-growing parish. Russo Van Voorhees, Boswell Club president at that time, said that Mr. Higgins had been chosen because he is a man on the fighting line of a turbulent parish. Mr. Higgins, in his modesty and understanding, was quick in response to this award to pay tribute to the other members of his staff and say that considerable credit must go to them and the school board members who have provided the tools of education in our system and the proper teaching staffs. Lem, as he was so fondly called, was a man of this type, quick to give praise and recognition to others. As a memorial to Mr. Higgins, the West Jefferson yearbook had this concluding paragraph, which is well worth repeating today. Although Mr. Higgins may not have a granite monument in his memory, he still has a monument of outstanding dimensions. Each person who passed through the schools of Jefferson while he served as superintendent of schools is a living monument to his greatness as an educator. I'm George Sanchez. We have just met another of the people for whom a Jefferson Parish school was named. 
another person who has contributed to our past, shaped our present, pointed the way to our future, another face behind the school. This has been another salute to an educator for whom the Jefferson Parish School is named.